everyone. Welcome to Cat Eyes. Um, thanks for coming, spending your time with us. Um, very. I'm just gonna say thanks for all those that sub this channel, the other Cat Eyes Return and the Return of the Cat Eyes. Um, I'm glad you were back to my original channel, and I'm grateful that we're here. So thanks, and I'll give it to Totter. Cool. Hey, what's going on? Um, it's been a while, you guys. Long time, no see. It, it's good to be on air again. Um, yeah, tonight we're just going to do um, with the research team. FB's got some stuff he wants to share with us. One Conscience got some more data. And James is going to go over a few things um, to get people up to speed on what's, what's going on with some of his research as well. Um, so that's pretty much it for now. Um, anybody else got anything to say about Anything? No, FPV, it's all yours, brother. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rob. Thanks, Cap. Hello, panel members. Hello, guys in chat. Yeah, back with some more research update, guys. I'll just present this to everyone. Right, I'm going to give you some quick map familiarization and point out our known world in what I've been decoding as the original world map and the blueprints we call the Nazca lines. Uh, if you can see my mouse, I hope you can. Can you see that, guys? Someone shout yes. You saw no. You see my you're, sharing, you're sharing it here, yeah, but I don't know yeah. if they could see it out there. Yeah, if you can see it, they should see it. Right. Yeah, what we've been identifying is the known world map, right, guys? Uh, where you see the whale there, top right, that's kind of roughly above north east Russia. Uh, coming back over the west side, this to so this coastline type shape here. These, this would be Alaska, Canada, USA, uh, South America. This kind of strip going down here. So just to familiarise yourself with this this old world map, because that's kind of what we're looking at here. You know, these are the locations you can see here. Eventually, they're going to tell me, you know, where in the world they are. But currently, I'm going to introduce you to this side of the world and give you a bit of a breakdown of what's happening here in the underworld. Now this area here, this is down in Antarctica, we won't actually get to see any of this. Well, not like what it's looking there. So keep watching, I'm going to take you up and start introducing you to parts of the world you should start recognising and we'll overlay this technology where it needs to be. Right, that's the Antarctic coastline roughly, where this here is. Where you can see that there, that's roughly the Antarctic coastline on the real world map. You know, this is a famili familiarization course for you, so you know where this, where these overlays are in the world, basically. Now this part here, this is Easter Island. This is South America. I'll keep playing it, just so you can see a bit more. The monkey wasn't South Africa, guys. It's South America, and it's located there. So that is part of South America on the real world map. Then we're getting into Central America, sir. So I'll, I'll let it play. You can see antennas here as well. Look, see that antenna there? That's coming from somewhere near the... South American plates here, that'd be a large plate there. What can I what I can identify here for you as well is um some winds. You know, there's some actual winds have got a name. Pineapple Express, for instance. Jimbo mentioned the Pineapple Express. And when I looked at this technology, I could work out where it, what's causing it. If you look at this coil here, see the coil there, there's one there, there's one down here. In between there is what's called the Pineapple Express, and it is these two coils that are responsible for it. So just so you've got some familiarization there of where, what, what's where in the world. So that's the Pineapple Express. It would go across there, which is roughly top of South America going into Central America. And it seems to be coming from Hawaii. Right, so this plate here, you can see this in, in red. These two coils here, this top coils up in a location in Canada. 
this bottom coil is uh, roughly Central America. I couldn't give you a location off the top of the head, but it's it's underwater. There's like a round part there in the land, and it's underwater there. Now the spider geoglyph, it's it's I, I haven't put it in there, but yeah, it's attached to this. And like Jimbo, you know, I've been discussing these geoglyphs with the research team, and Jimbo rightly says, yeah, well, it's a dangerous spider that's uh, that's portrayed in that geoglyph, so it's a kind of a warning, which makes sense. You know, any geoglyph that's using a dangerous species is basically giving you a warning. There's, you know, there's a warning that something could be wrong in that region. Now, the region we're looking at here, obviously, it's not far off Bermuda Triangle. You've got uh, locations that Jim Book can reference in Canada that I can't remember the name of, but there's quite strong, uh, I think it's tidal movements. And that, that's, that is definitely put down because of this technology here and this big plate. If you're there, Jim, uh, feel free to jump in and Yeah, comment the on Bay that. of Fundy gets the 52-foot uh, tide. Yeah, so that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> right, the Bay of Fundy. Yeah, that's somewhere in this region here. Jim would uh, be better. It's probably be that blue line there, is it, Jim? It goes up towards that coil. That looks like something I've seen on the geo, uh, a geoglyph before that I've... Yeah, it would be uh, just off the blue plate, the big blue plate near the oh, you know, yeah. point of the wedge, yeah. Right, yeah. So yeah, you've got, you know, you've got things we can relate to in the real world there going on, that being that, part of... That plate can get, give us our northeasterlies too, which, you know, we get a westerly wind and storms coming in, some north... Um, uh, you know, nor well, they come down northeast, and then you get a, a, a an easterly blows in. You get like storms of the century, they call them, because the winds are coming from every direction and meeting over the mid Atlantic there off off Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and it's a terrible place to be in a boat when you have those storms. In fact, there's a movie about one of those storms, the storm of the century. George Clooney and a bunch of fishermen go against it and lose. Yeah, nature, nature wins there. So familiarization again, guys, that's kind of helping to going up into Canada and the bottom bit's going down into central USA. So yeah, it's quite large. Whatever that particular piece of technology is, it is humongous. <laughs> well, it all is, you know. By yeah, comparison, the, the scale of this is huge. The plate a little farther north, or that plate, maybe the one that runs across, or the one farther north runs across and gives us the curtain of light, I think, that is the Aurora Borealis. Right. It just, just seems to all fit. I'll let it play, because I'm going to overlay it onto the real world map now, so you can see what's going on. I know, I'll pause it. So a real world map, we're looking at this configuration here using these overlays. That's roughly where we're at with them overlays there. I've already done this side because, you know, this is, it's quite easy to get at. It's all in one big strip, basically, top to bottom, complete coverage. So you can see there now, that location in Canada where that coil is, this one, Central America there. Uh, that's ex exactly in a beeline with the uh, northern lights in Canada, across the northern uh, part of the country. Yes, that was a good overlay, Jim, yeah? Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, because the uh, east line looks like correct, you know. It'll be close, there might be a few bits off, but the, uh, you can see that what I meant about the Antarctic coastline with this part here being in line with it. So it was like a cut-off point of technologies happening, oh, so we think happening there. And the other ones around the other, the rest of the world, as they reveal more, I'll keep putting you know I'll keep putting them on here. But this side held the most interest for us at the moment because there's so much going on in it, and it was easy to start breaking down into the locations and what was where. Um, I'll just show you an image. In fact, wait a minute. I'll just flick over to this image to show you we do check and double check a lot of things. And 
You can see that image there. This is the one originally Jim took from Google Earth in around 2011 of this, this plate in Iceland. Now it concerned Jim, um, the last time we showed it, we showed it as uh, part of the Greenland plate, which is this one here. And he wasn't happy with the alignment, rightly so, because if you look at the alignment there, it doesn't match this plate. We went back to it again anyway and fixed it because it's actually part of the 8x8 grid. That's the central part of the 8x8 grid. And if you look at the location where that plate comes through, it matches it perfect. So yeah, it's in the right it's in the right, right location. So you know we we do check and double check things. <laughs> so just just as well you did, Jim. You know it was bothering Jim. The alignment didn't seem right until he looked at it again, and then I realised it's part of the 8x8 that's showing. Uh, if you want to mention that other place, Jim, that you mentioned, that island. Well, that was that's one that found that one, so she should maybe mention it. So. That one, yeah, yeah, go on. One. <laughs> I wasn't sure about it. You there, one? Yeah, it was yeah. Um, Oak Island. So there's that show. Anybody that does watch any television, I did recently because I was in a hotel, but <laughs> usually I don't. But um, if they unearth a big a metal plate so it's right um where is it jimbo you know better where it's at than i do yeah it's uh off the atlantic coast just off of nova scotia where it was like heavily traveled by pirates who dumped cannons stuffed with stuff can you see my mouse Jim? filled with pitch but yeah it's just off the atlantic coast around you know new brunswick and prince Edward island and nova scotia of this area where my mouse is. Okay, yeah, I, I got you click now. Yeah, the, the North Atlantic, basically. Yeah, that's what's wrong there. Right, I'll jump back out of there. But... Oh, I've got to present to everyone. So, yeah, in case I wasn't presenting there, it's there. Look, you can see it's part of that 8x8 grid. What the. the orange bar that Jim located. I'll just go back to presenting the uh, grid. So there's the configuration guys, if you can see that. That's what it looks like on our land masses. Well, part of it. <laughs> so I'll keep that playing. That was a little tour of the Americas there and a breakdown of the, of the technology and its locations and some explanations as well. Now, of course, I'll just I'll remind it a sec. Of course, you should have seen a discrepancy there. It is pointed out. You can see the mouse again. All this in the west isn't even catered for yet. We've been looking from there to Alaska, say. That's... that's what we've been looking at so far. Now this whole area out in the west. This is a new area. It's um, going to reveal to you what I think. Well, hold on. I'll, I'll just show you this. This is it roughly just thrown across series of map now. So we can get a, you know, series is found extra in the north and south. So now we can expand east and west also using the information from the NASCA lines. It might not be super accurate, remember, because the land masses have changed since these were carved into rock. But they won't be far out, and this, te this technology does exist, and it's probably still in use, because it's part of how, this, how the world works. So you can see in the west there, the Paracas family, this whole area, I've been trying to bring it to life. I can see now where they've been cutting roads and, you know, hiding things and mining and building to try and break up what it really is. And it is, it is huge. That It's got to be the world's largest antenna. And on a side note, um, the Peruvians believe that the giants that came and, and, and sort of took over came from the West. Yeah, I would believe that. You're looking at that. That so it may be a place of giants also. That geoglyph is about, it's over five miles long. Hold on, I'll go back to it. 
you know it's all it's all been broken up remember but i'm going to show it you now right if you can see the mouse top bits there coming down to the bottom that's just one part of this then there's all this on the left there's all this over here obviously where these fields are has been uh, hiding things it's it's everywhere but i'm, I'm going to show you what it is and Give you a little tour of the place. So this is out west, guys. This is out way past Hawaii. Another world away, nearly. And if you look at the, it's a, the large antenna design, these green lines, they actually use the ridges of the mountains. Very clever. It took me a while to figure out what, what all these lines were connecting to. But they've used the top, the ridges of mountains, you know, to basically portray, this is, this is, these are cables. You know, this is part of a very large antenna system. And they've been placing them everywhere, especially now that it took me ages to figure out what was going on, why, why I'm getting green lines going along the top of mountains. And then it came, to, you know, it came to me, it's a very large antenna that they've been chopping up, you know, put, uh, mining and building and breaking, basically breaking the whole shape down so you can't make out it's one actual piece of equipment. It is one, one huge antenna. And I think this is the one reference in scripture as the great tower in the West. I think this is what it's depicting. But take a look at it, you know, if these lines, they do go everywhere. And like I said, they've been using the, the, the ridges of the mountains. It didn't make sense at first until I started tracing those. And I thought, oh, it's, it's an antenna, another, an, another larger antenna. The world's largest antenna, you know. There's lots of antennas in these geoglyphs, but... This thing, this is this is the antenna of antennas. You know, there could be one, there could be one in the north, south, east, and west. But this is the first one I've come across that I can actually say is one complete antenna that's been broken down into many parts. This is that um, the one I showed you in the previous video. I filled in a bit more now. Remember, at the right angle, it will jump out at you in 3D. You can see it there the different levels on it. A lot more detail you can see now how it, would, how it would connect to something in the distance over there remember these are these are below ground so forget the forget the landmass that you're looking at it's just been carved there to show you the detail these are actually all this is uh, portrayed as being below ground in my opinion and it's basically the workings of the world so yeah going back to giants pretty sure now the creator assigned giants to have these carved at Nazca, peru as the world blueprints for everyone to come and learn from. You know, the, it's, these, these geoglyphs, like the antenna, it's five miles long. These were not done by guys. You'll find the National Geo Channel, the train, uh, a couple of guys with sticks rubbing, rubbing the ground. These weren't done by a couple of guys, by a couple of guys with sticks. That's ridiculous, theory. These were these clearly done by giants. They were taking the tops of mountains, for God's sake. They were chopping the tops of the mountains off and carving straight lines into them. Uh, right, down to these geoglyphs here, guys. I don't know if you can see them very well. I'll just play a bit more. Right. Can you see there where this guy at the top left, this one, is, they call it the Voyager. Now look at his hand and what he's holding. Remember this green is part of cabling for an antenna. Can you tell these people, Jim, what, that's, what that reads to you, that geoglyph? Hello, Jim. I think you muted it. Jim, hear that? <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're not. Right, he's must be FK. I was, anyway, I was really over muted there. <laughs> I was just <laughs> behind windows and just. I was, it doesn't matter. I was just going to lap it, but. Oh I'll just God. pass it to you to give a little breakdown of what that image is portraying there, Jim. Well, you know, a lot of people these think these are characters of people. Well, that they do look male and female and stuff, and they could very well personify male and female. But the one on top, and and they both have you know different kind of number of tines on their hair. And the guy on top actually has his right hand on a wire. 
Well, there's a right hand rule in, in electricity is that, you know, the direction your fingers are going when the, the, the current is flowing towards your thumb is the direction of the rotation of a magnetic field. So, you know, I, I don't know for me if, if I was trying to read it as electrical code, it's just tells you the direction of the current or the magnetic lines of flux through that line, through that system, basically. And those things on their hairs, the tines, I'm not sure what they'd represent. Switching or just like, you know, they, they, they look almost like transistors and, you know, truth yeah. logic circuits, really TTLs. Oh, oh my, oh, my, think, my thinking was uh, it's like, you know, like warning RF energy, danger, microwave energy or, you know, like electric shock, the hair standing up on end. That was kind of what I had when I first looked at them. Well, you know, honestly, a lot of RF waves of a lot of kinds are worth staying away from. If you can keep your distance oh, yeah, from yeah. them, you're way better off. It was kind of telling me, you know, this is RF energy or danger. Yeah, so, you know, they're like it's like an early danger sign. Now, you know, look again, guys, you know, this has been carved into rock for since since <laughs> since the world was created, basically. These are the world's blueprints. And look at the intelligence in these, carving these into rock. What is this betraying people? It's it's telling you there's electrical work been happening here. And to be careful and treat it with respect and to know how it works. Well, you know, here's a funny thing, you know, and I've had it on mountains and other stuff too, whether it's before a storm or during it. If lightning's going to hit, you feel your hair standing on edge on the back of your head the static and whatever the charge in the air you can actually feel it most people don't recognize it as a warning that you know there's too much charge in the air and, and there's going to be a lightning bolt somewhere usually pretty close if you're feeling it so yep. you know usually it's on mountains and hills and when you're up higher and stuff but it, you can be anywhere you know anywhere Anyway, yeah, you're right. There's small geoglyphs, guys. Look, danger, usual signs. This one here actually looks like the guy's jumping out of his skin. <laughs> if you look at that, oh, look, he's like actually left his skin behind and jumped out of his skin. I think that's what that's going to portray. But they, they also have yeah. a definite number of tines and, and shapes to their, their heads, you know. So Yeah, yeah, that one's got more lines and on the top. Still coated. If they're, yeah. Like I say, their eyes look more like, I said, like, Switches now, and other stuff. Well, obviously, or, you know, obviously, he's going to get it shocked because that one's plugged in. Like the, the same with that one. You know, he, if he touched that, he'd get a shock. This the green one. Anyway, one um, what number would it be? Like he's smiling, and I'm not sure what, what he's got yeah. in his hand there, but that's not connected to anything. Two. The third from the right, his face looks like a, a, a double pole, single throw switch. It's exactly what his his that yellow in his face looks like. You know. Him over here. Yeah, the third one. That that in electricity would be a, a single throw, double pull, they call it. It's a switch in this face. The other ones have different, you know, configurations. I don't know what they mean as but the one, one face, if I if, if yeah. I had to call one that was actually, you know, related to an electric circuit, I'd well, call that one a, a you know, when I first single throw. When I first found these, Jim, these are called the Paracas family. Well, when I first found them, I thought, why would these, you know, I didn't add these green lines on the on the ridges at first because I, I didn't realize they existed until, you know, until I put these characters in. And I thought, well, why are these over here by themselves? They're not actually represent anything. This guy looks like he's trying to touch something. And that's when I realized these these lines go along the, along the ridges. You know, I started, that's when I realized it's a huge antenna that all kind of around and, re and portraying and it's telling you how it works, basically. You know, with the flow of energy and, and more characters anywhere. mean more controls needed there, or whatever. More, yeah, more yeah, operations. So two, three, four, five, six. The book nine just in that area alone, which is quite a lot for one area. And they're all like roughly around the base of that area of this giant antenna. I'd laugh if you found a dozen, and then no <laughs> more. You <Yeah>, really. <laughs> But there could be more. But you can see there, look at the scale of that, guys. Now, there's all these, these parts left of there. They, I'm pretty sure they all connect into one huge whatever it is, you know, this 
I think this is what's um, running the sun, Jim. Or this is this is where Construction, the construction is just more of the same. It's it's all yeah, it's part of one. It's just just part of how the world works. Yeah, I'm not sure which part, but it's definitely the Western Tower. Certainly part of the same construction. So I'm not even sure if it's part of our world. These buildings or whatever they used to be here, I don't even know if they're a part of it or are they built on top of something to hide more. That's what you find, you know. You'll you'll get you'll be, you do a lot of line work and you'll just come across a construction site that's just wiped out a lot of uh, information. They're all over the place as well, you know. At the bottom of the hill, there you got these fields and things going on. I mean, you, you know, I suppose people have got to live somewhere, but I think they need to really need to now start considering what these lines represent because they definitely haven't been portrayed properly. You know, uh, when have you ever seen the lines portrayed like what you're seeing here? I've never, if I'd seen them like this, I would have said years ago, wow, something really special going on there. But no, you, you, you're not seeing them portrayed in this correct format like this, in, in its completeness. You're just seeing images and the odd lines here and there. As your uh, avatar there, Jim. <laughs> it's all o'clock. That's like the cut-off region for the sun. You, know? you, you want to know something funny? At yeah. uh, McGill, they have a supercomputer, a big blue, basically. It's... Uh, about as big as a, a tennis field, a tennis court, but three stories of it there. Uh, in, in any case, the software that was used for really decades was a little Linux program. It was called Kermit. And when you started that little program, you saw Kermit the Frog. <laughs> and you'd program in everything from, you know, students' names, whatever, and just you use Kermit to do it on a little Mac with Linux, control the supercomputer. But you use Kermit. It's just the idea that that little frog is there if it's a frog and that, you know, the little frog was controlling a supercomputer. Just <coughs> thought it was strange. <laughs> Another thing with these things, guys, if you can see my mouse, the, the shape of this thing here. Another thing you notice there, the bottom of them sometimes have different parts of them and it's got different amounts of uh, these black lines, I would say different values. You know, when you look at a resistor, you've got bands on with different values. Well, some of these, whatever these may be, also have bands on the bottom, and some have like two or three or four. So there's some kind of a, you know, some pattern going on to these, what they represent. I'll probably never figure out exactly what these these parts are, but they're some part of some kind of an antenna system or related to coils or the switching of technologies, that's for sure. And, you know, we're getting into what I've said before now, but the you know, giant, the creators definitely designated giants to create these on this scale. It has to be, you, you know, you cannot see guys making a five mile geoglyph just to walk down. It's, it's ridiculous. No, these are something very special and they've been hidden. So here's my plea to the Peruvian prime minister. Please stop all work which further destroys the creator's blueprints we know as the Nazca lines. These blueprints were placed for all to see and learn from. Please do your utmost to help preserve them and tell their true story. These lines and geoglyphs are being intentionally destroyed by building, farming, expansion, roads, mining, bad planning and sabotage. I just hope all the destroyed ones have already been recorded and are made available to the public. The people telling their story are clearly lying and withholding information. I see the big picture with my decodings and they speak for themselves. They translate into real world data easily and help explain many things to do with our worldly workings of which our researchers and myself can identify and process into our reality. They identify the real world map sometime after our world's creation and detail all the workings of the underworld in their full glory. I hope you receive this message and make this information known and seriously consider my decodings. They are the most important thing I have ever looked upon. Yours, FPV Angel. I'm going to show you now some signals also from the Mimic Map guys. 
because these are related to what's going on with these switchings. I'll just, you've seen most of them bits before, I'll just forward through them. They're just more geoglyphs, more locations, more markers, more technologies, more proof, more evidence, more bad news for the globalists, which is a good thing. So we're going to jump to the mimic map and find it. <laughs> See you somewhere. Wow, it's going to blow you away with all these, wasn't it? There, mimic map. Okay, so here's some of the technology in action that we're seeing on the mimic map. You'll see it. some of it uh, happening. Here you go. Watch all these. This is this technology in operation. Undeniable. Very strange. Blow your mind, kind of transmissions that can span the length of the world in seconds. Well, however long it takes. I'll pause it there because we're going to jump over to one conscience's information now. So I'll hand over to you one, and I'll bring up your um, your ocean lines videos. I think I'll bring that up first because it is related to what we're looking at here. So okay. While you, <laughs> while you uh, get yourself ready for that, I'll just switch video. Yeah, FPV. Thank you for that presentation and getting it, getting it up, getting us up to speed with the new stuff you found. Good stuff, yeah, brother. I hope, hope, hope it came across yeah. okay, guys, and <laughs> and you receive it well. All right. So what you're seeing here is I'm going through and outlining the lines that are under the ocean floors. Um, you can see how they relate to the Nazca lines. Uh, it's not really <laughs> too much explaining to do. Um, I did them in different colors so we could see how it, they're definitely 3D. There's definitely some kind of structures. It's our technologies. We can see the signals being sent from place to place. And where these big points are, we have events occur. These are very active places. That one right there is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Anybody that has ever looked into earthquakes knows that that's a very active place. It seems to have a, a 3D structure look to it. <clears throat> um, the green ones are lines of volcanoes. So anywhere you see the bright green that's actually undersea volcanoes. Um, this one kind of looks like a, a guy. Well, it went by, but some of them, they've taken shapes. And I was pretty amazed because when I do this, there's the Australian one, by the way, Michelle. Um, I was zooming in and doing this. And as I zoomed out, I kind of saw how they were developing shapes, uh, structure figures. Some of them kind of looked like, you know, people. <laughs> Um, I haven't shown them all because I was kind of on a short time limit today, but, <clears throat> um, you know, on different areas, there's pyramids under there, but we can just see the signals coming out of these areas where they come from, where they hit. And we know it's true because the, the, um, activity of earth occurs in these places. Yeah, it's also verified on the mimic map what you were seeing before, guys. These signals are actually going to these locations here. These are like the Nazca lines on the world scale. You know, Nazca lines themselves are like the blueprints uh, compressed down to one, one area so you can get a big picture of it all. But what one's done here is gone, gone around the, the globe and highlighted what's on the ocean. You know, but there's probably more than that, what you can see there. They do hide and mask a lot of things on the seabed as well. But, I mean, what you've seen there already is a lot of information. <laughs> Some of those miles are, what, hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but thousands of miles long. They're huge. Yeah, and this isn't complete. Um, I'll continue to work on it. It takes quite a long time. You probably know that FPV to find the lines and then, yeah. you know, trace them out. <laughs> so it takes a long time, but it's worth it. There's a person. There's the one. That one was the one that quite abased me. You you can see the face. I just went through and colored them in in different colors. 
because if you zoom in the lines look a little different um, different lines do look different and the green again is all volcanoes so you know that's it's following our line of fire it's not a ring of fire it's a line of fire yeah straight line across the equator guys that's what we're looking mm -hmm. at really yeah they've chopped the world up so bad to hide it but, you know what we showed you in the west just before on the last lines doesn't exist <laughs> you will not find it on the map but it's there it needs put back on the map correctly and the, the map we're using as far as we're concerned is the correct one it just needs all these locations re-added yeah and look how busy it is i mean you know this is the energy flows so i find it pretty fascinating um, some of them turned it to look like coils, you know what I mean? And, and oh, yeah, yeah. it's just <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. Because when you're zoomed in, you don't see it. When you pull it back out, you're like, oh. Well, that area there, if you can see my mouse, that area uh -huh. there is where that little coil was off that large apparatus. Yeah, and I haven't even started so, in there. <laughs> in there. <laughs> I, would, I would say they probably masked that out looking at the color of it. Yeah, some of it they do too. It's blurred. It's not as bad as the land shots, but you know they've 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 skewed Google Earth to a point. Um, you can find a lot of good stuff on it, but they have blurred it out. So, uh -huh. all right. I'll, so. Next, I'll get your next clip ready. Hold on. Yeah. So I wanted to share that part with everybody because. It takes, like I said, a long time to do it, but I'll keep working on it. Uh, for the next part, I'd like to do a summary of what we've learned about our Earth energies and the flows of energies, the quakes, the volcanoes, and how it correlates with the work from FPV and Jimbo. Um, we've been kind of attracting some new people lately, so I wanted to kind of go back over it um, and kind of summarize it. Um, I'll share what I've learned and we can try to figure it all out together. So let's start with the quakes and their destroying and creation abilities. So where does quake energy come from? What we've learned is the energy comes from signals below being sent to the plates. When the signals hit the designated plate, it causes the, the earth to tremble and shake. Um, you may be wondering what signals I'm talking about. Well, the signals come from the design circuit board below. Signals are sent from area to area, plates, causing events to occur such as of our sun motion, our moon motion, winds, tides, etc., all of our natural earth events. When the signal hits the plates, it causes the shake that occurs. We do see steady movement of the signals. Some are the same each day, sorry, each day in and day out, literally. Um, these are the ones that are a result of the sun moving in and out of areas. Not only that, but they kind of cause a, a, a tunnel, kind of a boxed-in tunnel area. That's the path that the, travel, the sun travels. They're not large quakes. These are typically on a magnitude of zeros, ones, and twos. We don't feel these quakes as they travel through the plane. I like to refer to the zeros and ones as the ongoing flow coat code of our earth, kind of similar to the programming code of computers, the binary code, zeros and ones. I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's the program of our earth. Now we can see um, how they got that idea from our creator. Um, let's get into larger quakes and the release points. So what causes larger quakes? Well, I think it comes from a few things that I've looked into. One of the biggest and most frequent thing to affect quakes would be uh, the release of the volcanic energies, which are, creator, which are creators, destroyers, and maintainers of our known world. How can something be all three, you may wonder? Well, lava in a volcano typically runs about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's maintaining the heat and the warmth of our equator area. It's the line of fire. It's not the ring of fire, but it's the line of fire. That's the correct term. 
Um, there's lines and lines of undersea volcanoes that litter the land, the oceans, between the tropics and very heavily along the equator. They are our internal heating system of the earth. The areas are warm here, as well as the water, the waters produce our warm currents. So how do they create? Well, when they realize, as we see on surface, the lava flows out, it cools. As this happens, land masses are formed. There's an island called Belogoslav Volcano. It, the volcano is the island. When it does explode, it actually wipes out the entire island and reforms with each eruption. It's creating new la land mass with each explosion. The destroying aspect is easy to understand because this is the part we see on the surface, the part that affects people by the explosion, the lava flow, and the ash clouds that occur. They serve as vents in most areas to release the steams and energies along the way. This occurs on land and underwater. By the way, underwater will heat about 150 degrees more in an area when an undersea volcano um, releases its energy. So you can kind of understand why I've concluded this to be um, our internal heating system. Another thing that can add to existing energy is the sun itself. The sun also releases energy at times. Science calls solar flares. Although I have not concluded why this happens, I have concluded that these events will add to the existing energy flow and can lead to large quake events to occur on the surface. The extra energy will lead to a larger movement when it releases. This actually all makes sense when you realize and understand that this is all happening below us. Now, the last thing that affects the Earth energy are man-made technologies such as CERN. Well, why CERN? It's a particle accelerator, right? So they spin the atoms as fast as possible. They collide them. They say the collider contains the energy. Well, that's not true. What happens is they are creating this energy with their colliding and beam drops. They are making beams of anti-hydrogen in parallel rays. They spin these and it causes an electrical charge, which they then collide. The energy does release into the ground and it does not stay contained as they suggest. How do I figure this? Well, each time they do do a beam drop, a deep quake event begins. Why is that important? Well, deep quakes lead to the shallower, larger movement on surface. This is a result, again, of them directing this beam, the energy, the signals to the plates and causing the trembling just like it would naturally. But this is not natural. It is a man-made it's man-made to reverse engineer the system, make it behave as they want to rather than as the creator wants it to. Earth does have natural release spots for this energy that occur. <clears throat> Naturally, it would be the volcanoes. Uh, man has made other release points as well by fracking our land. What is fracking? It's when they inject liquid at high pressure into the subterranean rock as to force open existing fissures to extract the oils and gases. When they do this, they weaken the surface and cause a new ener energy release point. An example of this is Oklahoma. Oklahoma is the new release point of Central North America zone, where it used to be the new Madrid fault zone. Man has changed the creator's release points by fracking the earth to obtain the resources below. What does all this even mean or matter? Well, it matters because they are purposely changing the design of the creator to obtain all the natural resources for themselves, and then they sell the natural energy back to us. They keep us enslaved in the systems. This energy should be free to us to draw out of the earth and direct to use as needed. How would we do that? Well, um, Jimbo's going to build something and try to show us how to do that. But from what I understand, we would need uh, copper wire and quartz crystals are pretty amazing conductors of energies. Um, the ancients knew this. That is why the pyramids and obelisks are made of quartz crystals, possibly to energize the areas and direct it to specific areas of our ancient past. 
Now, I'm not claiming to have all the answers. I merely want to share my knowledge so we together can figure out a better way for the future. So the picture on screen of that big shot of land is where New Zealand rose six feet with one earthquake, by the way, the one that's showing. And that's about all I have. So I'll hand it over. Thanks for that one. Lovely information. Yep. Thank you. That was really awesome. And like I said, I really didn't make the connection between the um, radio signals from under the water, you know. I was still like not in Jacques Cousteau mode, you know. But uh, again, it's just amazing stuff that, you know, all points to, to one thing, you know. I, I don't have much of a presentation tonight. I've been working, doing a lot of other stuff, and um, I, I just, I, you know, I can only do so many things at once. I know I've had a good time. I, I've still been looking at a lot of stuff, and, you know, like they say, I hate expressions like that, but all roads lead to Rome, you know. You know, it, even if I try to look for something that might, you know, sort of like, you know, go against or disprove stuff we're studying. I, I, it just doesn't happen. Like when I found the plate and the picture of its proper orientation, I really, I thought, wow, that's a problem. But, you know, I shared it and it was only a problem for a few minutes that way. For me, it was, oh my God, why is this not where I thought it was and where I said it was, you know? But, uh, you know, <laughs> really as serious as all that because it was still you know in the end it wound up where it should be where it was and you know i was wrong well i mean plate still there <laughs> i'm sorry yeah. i was wrong oh, no. but <laughs> there are more plates like you know kind of popping up here and there like one of the interesting things about the one on oak island it's um a wedge or not a wedge but a corner that goes out, you know, farther out towards, like, for example, you know, the <laughs> the 8 by 8 that's in Greenland. It could actually be a piece or a part of that huge chunk, you know. It's, hey, it's just, Jim's just been there modestly, guys, as well. If you look on screen there, what you're looking at there is what I think is, uh, we'll call it the Canadian chakra for now. It's either a mandala, a Canadian mandala, or a chakra. Um, I'm saying chakra because if you remember in one of our previous videos, we showed the double helix uh, signal uh, at the winter equinox. Well, the location, this location here in Canada, this, this helix was at one point attracted towards this location and another point repelled by it. So it's definitely got something to do with switching going on. One being attracted and one being repelled. So, yeah, nice find, Jim. You stop being modest, mate. <laughs> that was a, I've been looking for that for ages, and you found it straight away. Yeah, I'm trying to keep my eyes open and peeled. That circle, too, is 25 miles or so in diameter. So, I, again, I think I mentioned it before. Anyone who may want to think that that's some type of irrigation uh, thing for, you know, a prairie farm, far from, you know. There ain't many things that in nature will form that, uh, you know, yeah, bullseye rings 25 miles in diameter. I just, I don't see it. That's what it really looks like. And again, it's location on a north-south, uh, you know, potential plate plate boundary. And it looks like the militaries took over the center of it. <laughs> uh, par for the course. Is that a military airport there in the middle of it or something? Oh, it could be, like, look, I'm looking at around here where our bases are and stuff around Ottawa and stuff, and they, they're very special reasons they take over these lands and these places. Yeah. I mean, there's just, uh, I don't kid myself no more. I mean, it wasn't just because so they nice you... props and they could blow things up there and no one would care. They, they're selected. If any of you guys in chat like playing in Google Earth, we've got lots of things like this to find yet, you know, chakras, mandalas, get looking guys, there's, there's things out there we still need to find, you know, if you've got the, this kind of interest we have and you like scouring land and looking for clues, well, they're out there, they're trying to erase them, but they missed this one, <laughs> Jimbo found that one. 
and there's more there's definitely more we just need to locate them and get them on the map so if anyone wants help for that by all means jump in and let us know what you find no, and I've done a little thing because I'm not really lazy, and I, I I like lights. I like turning on that little flashlight I have and chuckling every time I light up a building two miles away and shine it in people's bedrooms type of thing. But I'm I'm going a little bit bigger because um I I showed I, I it's it's a prototype now a prototype. It's a core that'll work and everything, but um. I got a 2,000 watt, you know, um, out, Jim. <laughs> searchlight that I'm working on. I can put it up to 3,000, but I, I probably couldn't even plug it all in here without blowing a fuse. But um, uh, I've got it up to 2,000 watts. I've got stainless steel cylinder and, you know, reflector coming there for the base. And I'm going to make a lens for it. But, you know, uh, your, your typical lighthouse has a 1,000 watt light in it. And I've got, um, I'll have... 3,000 watts stuffed in a searchlight. <laughs> uh, James, you know, I'll, you share that. I'll go ahead, FPV. Yeah, I was going to see if we'd put on video the, the build he's been doing. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to go through this one just to make it, uh, you know, an, a nice unit. But I, I'm going to repeat the process because I have all the tools and everything basically already basically bought. And, and just redo it a lot more clean because, you know, when when things look a little bit like, you know, like, you know, not pre-built and pre-finished, uh, they look kind of like, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, you know, building, you know, Frankenstein or something. It, it's just a little rough right now, but when I, when I, you know, get it and just plug her in, even without the lens and, and get it nice looking, certainly I'm going to start popping up a video and showing a good looking core because I, I still got to adjust some stuff. I, I figure I'm going to, I'm, I'm on a kind of circular design for the, 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 the light now, but I want to make a kind of cone, an inverted cone in the base. So, you know, light sort of points more at the very bottom of the paraboloid and it's bounced back up. No so much towards the size just design things just like i say it's and it's gonna be modular just anyone yeah. can build one i'm gonna show everyone the, all the parts and just i was gonna say can you put your camera on the show than what you showed us earlier <laughs> i can plug it all in and just uh, show you the brightness here let me let me make sure all four work too just give me a sec Yeah, I like I like uh, builds like this. <laughs> what did you think of the presentation, guys? Any questions on that while Jimbo's busy? Anyone? <laughs> no, you you guys actually covered everything. Um, there's um. I don't know if anybody in chat has any questions. Yeah, if you weren't getting any chat, guys, there's more land. <laughs> all directions hey, oh. all directions seem to be revealing more land. Yeah. Especially in the West. You know, that's not to say it's not up there everywhere else, but yeah, it's nice to see them pop up in the West on the Nazca lines. Yeah, I want James to just recap what he uh, said before about the sun's. Um, trajectory and um i'm sorry and um if you can just maybe explain that a little bit if you can shed some light on that when he gets back hey we have light <laughs> i'll just hold on i'll present you jim there you go tell us when you want to stop presenting and i'll stop okay presenting. Well, this, okay, I, that's it. it's, it's turned on, that. that's 1500 watts. I'm going to build it for 3000, but I probably won't really be able to run it, you know, more than 2000 to set up the focus and other stuff when it's at that stage. That white light over there is 1500 watts. And like I say, when it's all said and done, it'll be this, this one light will have 3000 watts output if I'm running off a generator or something on a beach. It'll be pretty portable, you know, pretty pretty handy. Yeah. Probably when it's finished, its total weight will be under 30 pounds. 
should be fine. <laughs> yeah, and that's it switched on and working already. Yeah, I want to see the build of that. Look cool. Oh, any questions from the guys in chat on anything we've been mentioning or at least arriving and missed it? <laughs> That's I think that was the hazard of switching back to your first channel, Cats. We probably left a lot of people behind that weren't uh, sub to this channel. Well, I mean, um, FPV or James, one of you guys can answer this. If you guys can just kind of go over like how the ALOs project energy or project um, the sun. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, it's in one video, yeah. CERN, guys, uh, CERN, in my opinion, is a reverse engineered angel, the technological version. It's a physical coil below ground. They call them a partic particle accelerator. Uh, it they physically projects an electromagnetic halo into the sky with nodal points. They call them sun dogs. You will see images or video of these when there's barium or certain type chemtrails in the atmosphere that's, that reveals them. Barium is usually the best, because that's what it's designed to do. And you will find the sun traversing around the outside of them, going about its business. You know, the sun, the moon, but from what I can see, all luminaries are controlled and manipulated with this kind of technology. This is technology below ground that the NASCAR vines revealing locations of and Part of how it works. Jimbo and Mon's work helps break it down into real world data on locations and events. And, you know, Jimbo's give it a good breakdown of what actually how the sun works, what it is, how it can be magnetically trapped by these halos and moved around the sky. Now, they're basically like a horizontal and vertical hole. What we don't know, or what I don't know personally, is if the sun is really in the sky, or is it just a particle in the accelerator below ground going round the coil and it's passed to another, then another? Uh, so it's, I would say it's something in the sky. Looking at the Nazca lines, it, it suggests to me it is a sort of object in the sky because it's got that cut off point at the end, which is basically Jim's avatar. The solar clock, it's something's marking it going across, and when it gets to a certain location, it's going to kill that signal and restart it in the east or recycle it round the north, say, for the 24-hour uh, northern summers. Hope that makes sense. It's a lot to take in, isn't it, guys? But if you follow our yeah. work, it's not great enough. It'll fall into place. You just need to watch these videos. Question from Padawan in chat there. Hi, hi uh, D. Uh, could it be that this technology is subverting the, what I think, living realm? Uh, looking at its design, the, it's designed to help promote and, you know, flourish, make this world flourish and keep growing. Uh, by design, you know, if you, if you looked at the video playing when Mom was speaking about the volcanoes, you were watching creation right before your very eyes. This is what this... This is part of what this technology can do. It creates landmass. I don't know if you watched that slideshow, but you can see it creating the landmass in the background when one was talking. So by design, it's creating our world. You know, this and is. I I think all this free energy that we're supposed to have and be able to harness because it's there for us. We're creators. Having it and having it free would allow us to create having taken it away from us, well, enslavement again. We're no longer creators. Yeah, no, creator. I'm not I'm not sure what what time span or or era we lost contact with this technology, but I'm pretty sure humans were taught it and practiced it, you know, they've helped maintain it and run it and develop it, I would imagine, into 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 other uh worldly workings. Well no, we have not, a good not on a, not on a creator size scale, but in a lo on a localized scale, you know, and they're doing that now. The reverse engineering of like CERNs and uh, HARP, because you know, don't forget the all the weather is also technologically controlled. Everything's technologically controlled. The whole nature process is controlled by technology, in my opinion. 
and people are naturally very constructive and builders by nature you know people build but that other side of it that destructive thing where you take whole cities like beirut or i don't care where and you bomb the hell out of them i mean what's the point there you know creation should sort of go one way to a degree this nonsense that you know everything has to be destroyed to recreate new brooms we all this nonsense i don't think that was the intent of the design either you know long term no, that's uh, long -term that's, that's that's human that's the human yeah. uh, factor isn't it canine dog eat dog nonsense yeah yeah people's trying to take ownership of uh our world basically they're taking ownership and of how it works and reverse engineering this technology to get very rich from but looking at you know various countries mandalas the nazca mandala the hindu mandala they're all telling the same story and days of old everyone knew how this worked we were taught this at one point they've just tried to hide it and just keep it for themselves that's what's been happening words actually fail me for <laughs> at this moment So that's what we're looking at guys it is a creation it's a technological masterpiece on a scale you can't even comprehend i wonder Ina could have struggled to describe it and portray what it was telling him yeah it's even if you know even by today's standards it's still beyond our comprehension the scale of these these things in this world or rather in the underworld the underworld exists and it's as big as our world if not bigger all hidden the early 1900s guys people flew over nazca peru and decoded these lines it shows them what what's where in the world these are the world blueprints you look at the real political world map and of course uh, greedy men are going to get greedy and want to go to these places and keep it all to themselves In famous words i think they're actually related to this if the world knew what we did they would chase us down the road and lynch us or words to that effect i think they're actually related to what they're hiding here so we live in a technological world people yeah you know? james do you want to just kind of go over um flux wave again you want to explain what you think, what these um these ley lines may, what the correlation is? He's like, why don't you do it, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you've been around a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'm reading the paper. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things is that you know um. The, the magnetic waves and frequencies is the way that something at a very low frequency can be turned into a very high frequency and blend with others to become even more powerful. You know, it's heterodyning. It's when, when there, there's, and it happens all throughout the nature of waves They're they're always changing from one form to another an obstacle gets in their way they'll sort of bounce off go around in some instances sound it'll echo well, in like, mountains well and, like the seismic the seismic graph it it um it records what's happening as far as frequency is is it's just distribution of frequency and um you can gauge what's going on with that you know well, as far as the um, volcano, the volcano, the sea, earthquakes, and not all of them, okay? Again, there are different types of earthquakes, but the machine-driven earthquakes that we're talking about have signatures. Um, they noticed, uh, I forget where it was, mid-Atlantic maybe, I don't know, but um, it was a recording of an earthquake signature, but it did something extremely odd, in fact, impossible in nature where you know how if a wave starts real high spike and descends in a kind of bell curve to nothing mm -hmm. well 
then it mirrored itself exactly opposite. It's like a mirror, exact mirror opposite earthquake happened. Well, that don't have, there's no such thing as an exact mirror opposite earthquake there. It's an impossibility. These were two signals just mirrored. They call it in ARPA in signaling. It's, it's like being able to read forward and backwards, you know, if, if you could turn every word, spell it backwards on a page and still be able to read it forward, you're reading in ARPA, backwards, basically. It's, it's important for computers and signaling because, you know, if, if, if say, your phone number is 555-1212 uh, five, 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 one, one, and it goes through the, 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 the computer, but when it gets at the other side, if it's backwards, if it's 2121555, the computer won't recognize it necessarily as your phone number. It'll think it's a different number. So it has to know addresses forward and backwards, names forward and backwards, and earls, IPs, everything forward and backwards, emails, your email. It's known both forward and backwards. You know, it might be da 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 at live.ca, but the computer, when it's sending and receiving data, it, it has to be able to interpret it, whether it's coming at it forward or backwards. It's called the NARPA addressing. It's, it's used in signaling. You have to. It's just like adding clouds to Photoshop of the Earth. You just you have to. It's like... You can't have radio equipment without big frequency oscillators, without heterodyne circuits, without certain things, without, you know, either Armstrong, Colpitz, or partly uh, amplifiers. I, you know, you got you know, do different things at different stages, use different types of amplification. Just, it's always the same thing. You know, once, once, once you know it, it's just like, you know, I don't know how to compare it to something. It's like if you if you fix cars, you know your engine, you know your 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 mounting blocks, your bolts, you know your alternator, your starter, you know all your parts, right? You know how they they work together. You know if something's wrong at one place, what it is? Battery dies. You either got bad contacts on the alternator uh, connections or the alternators got bad whatever bushings. You know, you know as a mechanic, you'll know what the problem is you know it's the same thing with anybody in any trade you you, you, you do it long enough you know you know it's, it's like it's hard to believe but there are people who are paid 30 40 50 dollars an hour to clean floors well it, it sounds so well, why would they pay people that much well these are very special floors they're all different and natural they're all marble and granite and other stuff and you can't just use regular detergents and wash them like you would any other floor. A lot of them, they take special precautions. And there are people who know these materials and know what they can and can't use on them. And if they make a mistake, they can ruin a floor. Because you can't, you can't, off some slates and other stuff, remove stains. It penetrates too far down. Natural uh, substances for floors are, are, you know, and in some of these buildings, they're, you know, pretty elaborate, eh? So there are banks and there are other stuff that's, like, they don't want stained floors or dirty-looking floors. So it takes really special knowledge and special products sometimes to do a job, you know? Not just anyone yeah. can do it. Do you want to... Um... <laughs> Um, go back into a, atomic absorption. If you could just recap that for some people. Yeah, light as we know it is generated by a process where waves of different frequencies hit, say, for example, hydrogen or hydronium ion that's free in the air. These waves excite the orbiting so-called electron that's in a, a specific orbital around the nucleus, as they say. 
and it gives it more energy. It, it, it stores that energy by going up to a higher valence. But that stored energy doesn't last because the wave doesn't last. When the wave loses its power, so does that stored energy, and it decays back to where it normally would be, the first orbital. And in that decay process, the energy that's released, we see it as light. Hydrogen gives off a nice blue light, in fact, a daylight. There's something interesting happened today, too. They did one of those FE core laser tests from some seven or eight kilometers away from a beach, but they had a little green laser light that was like bouncing. You couldn't really make out too well, but the blue laser light shone like the day. I didn't see that yet. Interesting. Well, uh, what's interesting is how how vivid the blue and that laser traveled, no problem. You know what I'm saying? It it it, it wasn't having an issue. That blue, it, it's so compatible with daylight. It was sort of looking like day in the flare around it. It's just amazing. But like I say, light is created in situ. Mm-hmm through a process called atomic absorption. When waves, we won't call it light, when waves, because light doesn't hit things, but when waves hit things, surfaces, some are absorbed, some are, you know, uh, scattered in the, the substrata of the material, and some is not absorbed, it's rejected, it's reflected off. It's that reflected energy that's not absorbed that causes the atomic absorption and the decay to happen. Well, in fact, when it rebounds, it's because it has nothing to absorb onto, and it's that portion of the energy that just gets totally rejected. It can't absorb, it can't go into subsurface scattering, it can't do nothing but get rejected. So it might be a brown portion or a red portion or a blue portion. Well, that rejected portion bounced off material and matter is what we see. We see a scene, whether it's trees in a park or whatever, water, lake. We're seeing the, the secondary emission, the light that's been absorbed, being re-released, or the energy that was absorbed in the scene, released, coming at us and hitting our retina, sort of after the fact. You're looking at your lake, you're looking at the past fact, you know, the monitor you see is actually being processed a split second after it's created by your brain. So you're looking at the past. We cannot live in the present. Like you think you're looking and you're seeing the present. You're actually not. You're seeing a very near past, a very recent past, but you're not seeing the present. When you look at someone, you're seeing someone in the past, whether you like it or not. In fact, is you're looking at your hands. You're looking at your hands in the past. You know, when I say I really believe it too, there is no time. If anything, time moves through us. We do not move through time. If it's anything, there's 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 no way. It's a constant that we live off of. It exists through us, at least conceptually. It doesn't exist as a thing, but that's another story. But yeah, light does not necessarily come from the sun. Like I say, and for me, the blue we see in the nice radiant blue sky, it's a secondary emission that we're seeing. Even the sun itself is a secondary emission. You're not actually seeing the sun. You're seeing the decay, the, the release after the atomic absorption of whatever energies, waves, rays, whatever they want to call it, electron beam for the CRT effect, whatever, it's just, but you're not actually seeing the sun. You're seeing a release of energy, a secondary emission. So all light, I can only repeat it, all light is secondary emission, moon, Secondary emission, stars, secondary emission, neons, incandescence, it's all secondary emission.
Yeah, good breakdown, Zim Jim. Yeah. Yeah, I, agree. I agree totally. Same with the idea of the plates. You know, we've been we've been discussing them among ourselves. The the tectonic plates, you know, a whole plate, like say the NASCA plate comes online, that's what's producing daylight, that plate being online. It's energizing the air around it, creating daylight. Uh, the sun just becomes a secondary, you know, secondary light source. That's our current thinking, isn't it, guys? It's somewhere along those those lines. Well, it's not 93 million miles away. It's not a fusing ball of gas turning into all different elements. It's going to supernova later. You know, all those myths and stories mm-hmm. are exciting. They're fun. You, you've been giving them forever, and they, they sound nice, but it's all just hokum. Yeah, I was going to ask one um, about the the correlation with uh, the solar flares and earthquakes. Okay. If you wanted to um, just um, I don't know, talk a little bit more about that. Well. <clears throat> On your findings. <laughs> um, I mean, every time that the, they say that the sun releases large solar flares, which I'm, I'm imagining is some kind of an emission of energy, um, it, it seems to ground and it, it causes a deep quake event. So a whole bunch of little deep, you know, deep quakes will happen and it typically happens where I've seen it, but it, you know, it's not, I'm sure secluded to that area, but is around Indonesia and, and that little area where the islands are. Um, So several deep quakes will happen and then it'll lead to larger, you know, shallower movement in all directions. Right. When we were talking about, Earthquakes before, I, I just boarded it all wrong. I was thinking about what I said, and let me try to get it out this way, this way this time. Um, when, there's a, when there's an earthquake and there's a um, seismic reading, um, it's sending off a certain frequency based on the number, right? So my, my thinking is that number might dictate a particular signal to have a certain effect, um, is what I'm thinking. So they're going to vary. There's, variant, there's variance because they all have a different application when it's triggered. Um, that's what I'm thinking right now with what you guys have been showing me. I mean, am I wrong or am I just, <laughs> am I going crazy here? <laughs> you follow me on that, right? Yeah, I get you. Um, yeah, that absolutely has to have something to do with it. I mean, it's you like know, different specific- frequencies like dick guitar strings, you know, each string is going to have a different sound. Exactly. And whatnot, so it's going to exactly. have a different effect. So, it's just like all life. Life is vibration and energy, right? right? So, mm-hmm. the bigger and uh, the the bigger the quake, then it would definitely have a different frequency and vibration. So, you know, and it might even send to different areas. It might be like, well, this size kind of goes that way. You know what I mean? And yeah, and to uh-huh. do that, we'd I'd have to pay more attention to that part of it, like do. But large quakes seem to go out at, at least in two different directions but usually in every direction on my earthquake 3d there's a feature that you can um put like a dome around the quake and it shows you the whole area that'll that will be affected by that energy so it's kind of a cool little feature okay yeah yeah awesome do you want to hear a silly colloquial story about a volcano? And I forget which one it was, and a couple of Canadian tourists from Saskatchewan that went there. They went to visit, and I can, I'll find the article, but they went to visit one of these, you know, volcanoes out, you know, and it hadn't exploded or erupted for over 100 years. But when they got there into the top with their guide, they sort of like, I don't know, stripped down naked and the girl peed and other stuff. And all the guides was really pissed off and they got him off the mountain. But the next day it erupted. (laughs) Go figure. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) You know, you'd think there's no real relationship truly between the two. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Those events did happen in that in that way. And yeah, yeah, you know. (laughs) <laughs> these chain of events leading up to that. It's a strange way to celebrate getting on top of a volcano. I, I just I don't understand that kind of celebration myself, but hey. And 
and they don't represent all Canadians. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm kidding. You guys, I'm totally kidding. Um, what else, one? I know there was something else we wanted to talk about. Um, I feel like we talked a lot more on, on, the, on the back chat before we got going here. Uh, hmm, my brain is mush. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, you, I know you're tired. Um, I don't remember what all we talked about. Um, I don't, I don't know either. Um. Well, what does cats think? When I think about what you were all saying, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, you know, finding all this information is pretty good, awesome. And, um, you know, there's a lot to, to find out more about what, you guys are researching and hopefully sooner and later we find more truth on on our earth beneath us like they were saying you know you all were saying but yeah i believe that the giants were here on earth and everything that jane found it connects to the giants. I mean, yeah, we really didn't actually get into that tonight. Um, oh, wow. Uh, well, <laughs> I know we got into that before, but um, if James wants to get into that now, we can. But I, I thought we we're just going to stay more on on the current. Yeah, I think we stuff. should keep it current and 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 yeah. just them like like they say focus and yeah. for me I, I i get this problem i i run into like a stone wall as far as thinking beyond sort of where i am without you know brainstorming with other people so you know mm -hmm. I, without actually the interaction with one and fpv and hopefully others soon too but uh i mean i myself i wouldn't be getting anywhere but uh you know I'll, you know I, I think sometimes, at least for me, uh, I, I get over certain, because uh, I don't think I'm necessarily slow, but things don't register too swift, you know, you know, but, um, you know, some things that should be obvious, they just don't hit me quick, like the plate being skewed at a different angle, you know, I, I seriously could have, you know, been blocked on that for months and possibly longer. But, uh, you know, just sharing it and then a few minutes, well, here you go. It was part of the 8x8 eight eight and not the 12x12. 12 12. Well, wow. Right. You know. Oh, do you want to go over that real quick since you t we're talking about the bars and you talking about the Greenland bar and um, how they work as um, deflector plates? I think that's what you said they were. Yeah, basically, uh, I, I think what's happening is that, you know, the um, – Earthquakes happen in very specific successions, mm -hmm. relaying not only information to charge and discharge these plates in front of and behind the sun, but also, you know, the, the you know, determine other information. That's why there are more quakes than needed necessarily to move the sun, because they're actually communicating other informations that are relative to other you know, systems control. It might need to cool something off or warm something off in the north so it can turn on these these things to not affect the sun but affect the wind and, you know, cool something off. Like the ocean between, you know, Hawaii and, and, and the USA. The cool, you know, it's just the, 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 these things have more than one function and, and I, I don't know, it's like uh, sometimes you see that bottom of the Icelandic plate or the Greenland plate, just the bottom south corner of the long rectangle one on the island is lit up, you know. So 
they can be partially on or fully on, I imagine, or just have any configuration you want. And it seems like the northern half of the equator has one charge and everything in the south half of the equator has an opposite charge. It's a dipole, you know, for the most part. And it can shift that dipole between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and give us our seasons. And it's just a scan. It's a scanning system, a very big one, you know. It has a few major parts that it has to have to work. It's like your basic TV screen drawing across the face of the screen, back and forth, back and forth. And Retracing offset a little bit each time. It's the same principle. It's the same darn thing, but on a huge scale. Well, for us, it's huge, you know, but uh, the basic principle is, is, you know, it's like Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is often the, you know, right one. Usually the right one, right? Yeah. This is. You know, we see it work in the physical world. We grew up on television sets. Who didn't, you know? And they were the, the, the flyback with the old bubble tube and everything and the vacuum and, you know, the same kind and the same principle and the same kind of hardware and electrical design that is in the Nazca lines. Go figure. Same technology. It really, really is. Even our bodies and our brains, well, our brains, um, we work the same way as, you know, a TV studio would or a transmitter uh, station would, you know. We transmit, we receive. You know, who can deny we're not, you know, basically transceivers ourselves. You know, way back when, this is two years ago, I was saying, and I don't mean we're robots in the sense that we're heartless and soulless and no spirit, but with the construction, and it is construction, our cellular construction is much the same. It, um, we're built mechanically. We're a series of tubes, fluid systems, and electronics, and our, our you know, wave energy, if you will, but we're built the same as everything is around us, including TV stations, broadcast transmitters and everything. We're, we're a unit, that's for sure, but, uh, you know, bipedal and able to move around, but there's no difference between, say, for example, the radio signal or the signal a television station has to transmit to transmit a signal for you know, the composite color chroma signal, they call it, for the audio and all the syncing to make it all a uh, nice picture and everything. Well, guess what? When you take the signal that comes from the brain and the eyes and the ears and that composite signal, it's so strikingly similar to the composite signal of a, a television channel that you couldn't tell them apart. How come? Because it's the same thing. But, you know, I, I say and I repeat it, oxygen is a metal. We're walking in a 20% superfluid metal. We have windpipes, we breathe in air, it's all tubes, we have fluid systems in our skin, but we're walking around in a super fluid medium. When we use terms like air, what a misnomer, what a simplification. When we use terms like water, it ain't water. You know, at the very least, at the very least, I look at it as metal hydride. More importantly, it's always got free hydronium. That's making so much of this world tick. The fact that water, so-called water, has 7% naturally free hydrogen all the time. Well, as far as fuel goes, 
any 10% mixture of, you know, <laughs> free reactive product, free reducing agent is, is a fuel. So water is only 3% away hydrogen content of being usable as a fuel. And look how much there is around. So, you know, yeah. we haven't been using water as a fuel. There's, it's not because the science ain't there to permit us to do it. Because it's, in my book anyway, it's been suppressed. A lot of technologies are simply suppressed. Yeah. Even the so-called uh, bullshit Tesla stuff now, it's all dependent on paying for money for lithium batteries and all this shit. I'm sorry, don't mean to swear. No, I, no you're good. Um, I was going to ask FPV if you wanted to just talk a little bit about um, Brahma. As being the, the source or the possible source. He said be he'd be right back in the oh, back. Yeah. Alrighty. Yep. Well, something I could say real fast is someone asked in the chat a minute, a little while ago, actually, about um, you know odd volca volcanoes erupting, and what I was thinking and the theory that I'm thinking is that these signals have been kind of changing because I've seen two um, what they thought to be inactive volcanoes for quite a few years. Um, one of them they considered dormant have actually exploded. So I think that these processes happen and maybe some of these signals don't need to go come online for maybe even lifetimes, you know, and we wouldn't know about it. And even if it was in our lifetime, they don't tell us half the stuff anyway, so we wouldn't know about it. But we would definitely know if a volcano exploded, and especially if it's a weird one that's exploding now. So, you know, that's another thing is these signals may just come on, like, say, for instance, when we went into the age of Aquarius and, you know, then – inactive volcanoes may be coming online because something was triggered when we switched into that that great year to, you know as far as astrology goes right and they say the luminaries do give off frequencies also so there's probably some interconnection with the luminaries above and some of these power points below maybe they're mm -hmm. they're they're switching things on and um i mean i'm just i'm only speculating but um, yeah, and I was also looking into the different planets being in certain areas when large quakes happen. So when we're in the middle of, and I'm not an astrology person, um, but when we are put uh, with Saturn and Uranus, I believe, when they're opposites, and I might be wrong, when they are opposites, I might be wrong on the planets, but when they're complete opposites, it causes mega quakes to happen, which other people study into that. I was just kind of reading up on it. I have an astrology friend that may be hopping on board and actually giving some really good detail on that coming up soon. So oh, cool. It was it like some sort of like polarity effect or something. I, I, don't I know. mean, <laughs> it, they, they refer to the ones that are gas giants. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that can cause these mega quakes. So when they when they become in opposition of each other, something's happening. They're sending some kind of a signal that's making these mega quakes occur. But like I said, I'm not an astrologist. That's I don't know a whole, whole yeah, lot about it. But, but it, it kind of was cool because I had theorized yeah. that back when we started this with FPV. I don't know if I've ever said it on a stream, but I was wondering if the planets – Hit, hit, you know, ending up in certain positions would trigger something, and then come to find out, it actually does. So, <laughs> yeah, I think when you've had a conversation like this before, yeah, yeah, we we probably have. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it was live, but I think we've talked about it. So, but yeah, it's pretty cool to look into the astrology part of it. So, any astrology, you know, knowers out there, they could look into. Um, their astrology charts and, and find out did anything occur on these dates when 
when these planets were in alignment and you know different things it could be anything it could it maybe not just earthquakes so you could yeah right it could be a, a few different things going on a few yeah. different elements the right variables um if you will and then boom <laughs> like these volcanoes is, happen, yeah. you know we don't know right exactly so, so that's something for people to look into though and, you know, and the stars are, this, even though we don't see the stars during the day, they're still above us, still doing their thing. So exactly. they're giving off frequencies and, and whatnot. Then, um, well, I mean, I, I, could, I could only go into the realm of speculation, but it makes sense. Yeah, it does too. But yeah, that's that's all I wanted to add. Really, was these signals could you know these signals are changing because odd things are happening. But why they're changing, you know, I can only kind of like you were saying speculate. But I'm kind mm -hmm. of leaning towards that we changed into the age of Aquarius, and that would trigger different things to start happening. And we wouldn't have a clue about it because, well, our histories are hidden from us. So, yeah. you know, if it's recorded, it's somewhere in the Vatican basement or somewhere, you know, <laughs> destroyed. We we're not going to know about it. We won't ever see those documents. So, so we have to make our own documents. We have to start fresh and and yeah. record the things that we see now. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. The way I see it now, no matter how many documents and secrets the churches and all these cults have, it don't matter no more. It really don't matter. You know, that's just playing the game. Oh, I have something you don't have. Or I know something you don't know. No more playing that game. You know, it's over, you know. Well, this is um, this information that you guys are putting together is pretty compelling. So, <laughs> um, using real world data and and just getting all this going is um, starting to make more sense. So, yeah, this is definitely sort of like the Roman, I mean, the um, Trojan horse. Yeah, like if there it was only the one plate, okay, there's still doubt, but you know, one found another plate, and then there's another one, you know, down. I'm pretty sure, like, where Bird saw all the nice water and everything, that's another plate that, you know, was on when he went there. They're not always on the full length, they can be on sections of them or whatever. You can find an oasis somewhere along one of these plates, you know. And be freezing everywhere else and you know have 72 degree water in the middle of one it's just the way they are mm -hmm. but there's more than one and there's more than one people can see now and touch and feel and dive with and do whatever with and then, you know i'm sure all across canada and other places there are more places you can see this plate and touch it all over, like, Peru, I'm sure, and all the way down Chile. And there's there's got to be exposed plate up there. And just, I know there is. I mean, there's so many of them. There's A lot of them are close to the surface, or, you know, maybe even on the seabed, covered by, you know, a few feet of silt. That's why so much horizontal during it, drilling. They might just be drilling across one of these beds down the side of it and into, you know, a span between two other plates or a bridge between two other plates. I don't know, you know, I can only speculate. But a lot of these fault lines and rows of volcanoes and straight lines, they're, they're along the edges or the, the gaps between the two plates. Mm -hmm. Wasn't well, there a lot of fracking going on on some of these lines? Uh, Oklahoma has kind of like the record now. It used to be California was 
earthquake capital for the USA and stuff, but, you know, Oklahoma beats them hands down and quakes per day, quakes per month, quakes per year, you know, quakes when you're asleep, quakes when, you know, your dog is trying to pee, quakes. <laughs> they they uh, they actually have so many quakes and it's admitted now that it's part of the um, fracking industry, you know, basically. Um, you're, you, you're, you can buy earthquake insurance now in Oklahoma, apparently. And I guess they're working on it in Texas and other big fracking states. Because, you know, if you don't normally have earthquakes and then your walls are all cracked and half your stuff is broken, <laughs> you're afraid your house is <laughs> going to collapse on you when you sleep at night. I mean, you know, you've been damaged, you know. and It's not Mother Nature. It's these idiots fracking the shale and stuff. Yeah, and if you zoom in on Oklahoma, oh, my God, there's miles and miles and miles of frack pads. Yeah, and the worst thing is a lot of them have been fracked once, okay? They, they started a few years back a, a program. They call it um, Frack and Pray, where they're refracking as many of the old wells as they drained as they can to see if they can, you know, get a second breath out of them, if you will. So that's the uh, frack and pray program that's going on. It's a secondary push on all the wells that they've blown dry, basically. Yeah, Maybe it's another, just a way to get rid of garbage. I don't know. Another thing that fracked the shale is the um, the nuclear place in Nevada where they let off all those nuclear bombs. There's all those big potholes out there where they blew away that town. Yeah, yeah. nuclear farming. They wanted to like you know farm with nuclear bombs. Is that that you know early on in the programs it was under agriculture the nuclear program. <laughs> you know what they started fracking now? Yellowstone. Uh oh, <laughs> that's a bit idiotic. Yeah, you know, yep. it, it absorbs yep. certain temperatures, and you know like you know you know in a lab you'll use heavy mineral oil because it can take a lot of heat and it before it'll catch fire. I mean, it, it takes a tremendous amount of heat. It's just very hard to get it to ignite. Well, down below, there are things that take a lot of heat, and, you know, they, they're, they're meant to cooling, like lubricants, cooling agents, other stuff. You know, all this oil they're pumping out, it's there for a reason. I, you know, just like the sand that was put where it is there, like, you know, on the plate running out towards, you know, white sands all the way to probably under the ocean, probably all the way to Hawaii, 400 feet thick of sand or something. I mean, it's well, at least across the continental USA, it's not there for nothing. You know, these deposits are there. Like I say, the sand, like in the South Carolina on in Lexington, you look up a uh, Sandy run, it's 400 feet thick. It's so pure and, and all the same grain, it's manufactured. It's, it's ready to be put in bags and used in glass without any purification. You can use it in the best Pyrex, you know, best glass you can make. And it comes right out of the, well, they take off the topsoil and then there's all this pure quartz, all the same mesh, 400 feet deep of it. Hmm. It's not an accident. That's that's manufactured product. It's it's millions of tons of it. It's, it's not there by accident. But if we take it out, and it's going to cause problems. You know, it's there for a reason. We should leave it there for the most part. The fact is, we don't need it. We've got the energy above. We don't have to take out all these resources. Nope, it's everywhere. Hello, guys. Hey, there you are. Welcome back. Ah. What did I miss? Everything. Yeah. I just, uh, everything. yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no actual rants for a change. Well, rants are welcome, you know. We expect them now and then. <laughs> I yeah. have my own sometimes. Yep. Um... I had a question for you, man. I forgot what it was. Let me uh, go back and look at my notes here. Oh. It was Brahma. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I do have it right here. If you want to just go back and talk about Brahma a little bit. 
Yeah, sure. Brahma, the creator, the centerpiece of the uh, the 8x8 grid. Um, I was talking to Sanders Bernacci and he told me it was Brahma. I originally called it Satan. Uh, Brahma, the creator, it's the one in the center, then he has eight around it, which, uh, I w- which I would call, there's pri- nine primary angels there. You know, Brahma at the center and another eight around it. Uh, so you've got primary nine, and then there's all the, uh, the external ones. I think there's 72, not plugged into it. But the number 72 should ring a bell for some people. And that's where it comes from, the, the 72 virgins. They're actually, they're not linked to anything. But, you know, apart from wireless transmissions, it seems. You know, the, these are what we can see on the mimic map. Technology has been activated and deactivated. This is what your volcanoes are, you know, technology coming online and going offline and things like this. So, yeah, you know, it all fits in. It's It kind of mixes up scripture, uh, sacred geometry, everything coming to life in, in one project. It's quite amazing to watch. I don't know about you guys, but I'm amazed. <laughs> it just seems to get better and better. But yeah, Brahma, that's the centerpiece, the heart of the machine, the one that's running all the rest, it seems. Right on, right on. I've showed videos of it before. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll put yeah. it back on again if you want. I mean, you can put it on if you want. Um, you guys have the chat open, right? And I, I don't know if there's anybody asking questions or anything like that. Shout out to everybody there. I don't know if you guys want to give them a little shout out real quick. I thank everybody for coming. Yeah, thanks for popping in, guys. It was good to see people looking at our research and supporting it in any way or form. Or if you can help it even better. <laughs> uh, right, what we're looking for, Brahma the Creator. He's in here somewhere. Yeah, that's Brahma the Creator, the centerpiece of the 8x8. You see what I mean about others being plugged into him? There's like a primary nine, Brahma, the, Brahma in the center, and another eight around him, or eight, should I say, this particular piece of technology. And then there is even more that aren't connected to this, but definitely come online via ways of Wi-Fi transmission, it seems. You know, you can see on certain uh, maps, like, let's see now, I've previously done a presentation where a signal came from Antarctica. It went along one of these lines. It split into three. You know, one went to, roughly, well, it first hit Mount Etna, and it branched into three. The left one went to uh, possibly Mount Vesuvius or another volcano in Italy. The centre one went straight ahead and hit the Bosnian pyramid and one on the right branched somewhere towards through Greece and towards the Middle East. You know, we got that recorded off the Mimic map and I could actually overlay it on here and help me re- reposition the 8x8 grid and Jimbo's plate actually, you know, confirmed that re- relocation matched up, you know, it matched up with Jimbo's plate as well as what I was seeing, the part I was seeing where it splits into three, you can see where my mouse is. That was the three there where it split. So that would say be Mount Etna, that one there, that, that bump there. That one would go to Vesuvius or another volcano in Rome. That one leads to the Bosnian Pyramid. And this one went through Greece towards the Middle East, and I lost track of that because you can't see because of where the map was. But yeah, you know, that was the free signal split. I was looking for one into three. Come out and the signal came. You follow the line. It just came from the opposite end somewhere down in Antarctica. So it traveled quite a distance, that signal. And traceable over land. Which was pretty cool. You know, when you see it split into three there, and you, once I knew it was hitting Mount Etna, they could see where it was going. So the technology, you know, at play. What's who lives below the volcanoes? <laughs> the technology that runs it. Creative technologies. This is what they're hiding, guys. 
what Enoch tried to describe was these technologies and he struggled, but yeah, you know, you start going through various scriptures, doesn't matter what scripture it is, you start putting technology into that mindset and start decoding what they're telling you or start what they're trying to describe, it soon starts making sense. Hope that answers that one, Trotter. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was it. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else to add to anything tonight. Um, go ahead. If not, we can we can shut this down if you want. Just to reiterate, guys, it's a technological construction with a creator who used giants to help create this construction, then seems to have disposed of said giants. <laughs> oh, man, did one of the two? You know, someone. Someone's been busy. And since then, there's been people trying to hide what they've been, what the world really is. Obviously, for monetary and political gain, which we knew anyway. <laughs> but now, you know, this kind of confirms what's going on. There is more land. The world is a lot larger than they're telling us. And it's run by technolo technology you can't even comprehend. Well, we can actually comprehend some of it now because we're actually brought up with it. We're all guilty in some way of using said technologies. Because in my opinion, all technologies have been derived from the underworld in some way, shape or form. So yeah, you know, we, we're all we're all criminals. Well, not criminals as such, you know. We didn't know where it came from. But I'm pretty sure the people making it knew where it came from or where it's been derived from. But that's okay, you know. The creator put them lines in, in the in the ground for people to read and learn from and continue the running of this world you know someone's got to run it at the end of the day someone's got to take ownership well not ownership as such but play a part in their nation's care and maintenance of this technology over time perhaps maybe it does need upgraded perhaps that's NASA's real role upgrading and maintenance but you know reverse engineer it and lie it's something else I don't agree with that we can see what it is, and it's not man-made. That's where I come from. Over to you guys. FV, thank you very much. Um, Cats? You there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, well, I really thank all the ones that came in the chat. And support this channel again, which is our channel. And I thank Totter, FPV, One, James, um, for being on here too, as well. Um, if you're all done, we can shut down if you like. Yeah, all good here. Any, anything from you, One? You, Jimbo? As gold. I'm gonna get back to the the light core and <laughs> get the 2,000 watts working and uh, yeah. move on from there and just. It was nice tonight. Yeah, you guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for sharing all all the things you guys got right now. And um, yeah, we'll we'll be talking to you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, you guys. We'll see you all again the next hangout. Thanks for coming. Have a good night, everybody in the chat. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Yeah. You, much, love, yeah. You much, yeah, much love to the to the chat. Thanks a lot, you guys.